Hola, buenas noches. Buenas tardes. Good evening. Welcome to En Casa con la Plaza's Dan Guerrero Happy Hour, the first of the new year, 2024. Hijola. Anyway, we're here and we're going to have some fun tonight. Um, of course, La Plaza, uh, En Casa con la Plaza is La Plaza's virtual programming. Uh, we've been at it now since 2020, since the, the start of the pandemic. And uh, throughout all these years, we've continued to bring you the best of our culture, of our cultura, uh, to you via Zoom and via Facebook. So please, if you're on Zoom, go ahead and leave comments. Same on Facebook. Uh, we welcome comments, shout outs, questions as well. But we'll save them until the very end. A uh, little bit of what's happening at La Plaza de Cultura. Artes, we just don't reopened uh, after the holiday break just this last week. So we got a lot going on. Uh, as far as our exhibitions, we got them. You can come and visit uh, from Wednesday through Sunday, 12 to 5, and uh, enjoy our exhibitions. 18th and Grand, the Olympic Auditorium. LA starts here. You could come to our gift store as well. And spend some of that holiday money, that Christmas money that you got. Come down and spend it on, on some great art, uh, books, clothing, jewelry, and more from local artists and artisans. And then also um, we start at the end of the month with our programming. So keep an eye out on our website at lapca.org, also on our Facebook page. And uh, you'll find out all that's going on, not just for the next couple of weeks, but throughout the whole year. We got, we got film screenings, uh, our salsa, summer salsa returns. We'll have uh, some exhibition related material, uh, related programming, including Lucha Libre, a boxing expo, all in conjunction with our 18th and Grand, the Olympic Auditorium exhibition uh, and so much more. But I'll stop here because we have an exciting uh, show session for you tonight. Uh, and of course, how could we do it without uh, the man himself? Let's uh, welcome Dan Guerrero. Please zoom in, Dan. Happy New Year, young man. A toast to you. We never get to toast. Do you have anything to yes, toast? Yes, in fact, I do. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, I'm working. Good, good. I, got, I, I have the water, but thank you, Jan, Dan. Good for you. Good for you. It's another year, my God. You know, when I was a kid in grade school, if you had said I'd be alive in 2024, that sounded like space age and we all be in, you know, on other planets. And I, it's hard to believe, you know. So, and congratulations to you because you and Linda had a big anniversary and went off to Germany, right? Yes, we did. We did a, a, a once in a lifetime, hopefully not a once in a lifetime, but uh, one of those Viking cruises. Uh, from, yeah, they're great. They're yeah, from Basel, Switzerland, up the Rhine River. Uh, so a couple stops in France, a few stops in Germany, and ending up in Amsterdam. An incredible, an incredible experience. Good for you. Who knew they paid you that well there at Blasa? Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ash. <laughs> yeah. uh, mum's the word, mum's the word. Yeah, it was lovely here. It was a very civilized holiday day season and I, I i finally broke down i got my first um artificial tree i fought it to the end but oh. i had to it for and i'm in a condo building you know and bringing it in was one thing but taking it out and there and through the halls and elevators it, it was just too much so i must say it was much easier i gotta say i missed the scent yeah but it's easier Let's go to Trader Joe and pick up one of those those pine cones, those scented pine cones, yeah. and you're all set. No, I wasn't that smart. I went and bought friggin' candles that were $95 each. And when I brought them home, I thought, this doesn't smell like pine. But you know, but Trader Joe's, you're right. I should have, I should have done that. So we have uh we have uh we have a good show tonight. We have a great show tonight, our first guest of of the year. So um I guess do you have anything else you want to say? No, that's it. I'm just as I'm looking forward to to this session in particular. Uh, first, I had heard of Debbie, uh, our guest, uh, ahead of time. At, but once I started researching more at, with the information you gave me, I'm this is going to be yeah. great. So, great. Go She's away. great. She, All right. Thank you, Abel. I'll we'll see you in a minute. So our guest tonight uh, is a self-described mommy comic, the mommy comic, but she's also been described as, as the female comic for men and the women they love, which sounds very pithy, but I don't quite understand what the hell it means. I mean, isn't that everybody, men, women? I don't know. Small farm animals. I don't know. But watch this clip and maybe we'll get the answer. Abelardo. I was 
was written up in a magazine, they said, that Debbie Gutierrez sets women back 100 years and leaves women powerless. Are you kidding me? Ladies, you have all the power in your relationship. Your man comes home, he had a bad day. Can you fix it? No. He opens up his paycheck. Can it go far enough this month? No, you can't fix that either. Some guy rode him all the way home on the freeway, didn't even give him any space. You can't fix any of that. That guy comes in hungry, tired, frustrated. And you, my dear, are standing there <laughs> naked with a cupcake? <gasps> <laughs> That's power, sisters. Thank you very much. Okay, now it, it makes a little more sense, doesn't it? I describe her as unstoppable, and you will understand why once we chat. So zoom in, Debbie Gutierrez. Hello there. I'll look how beautiful you look. Oh, thank you. But you know what, Mija? You look like a grown-up. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. You look like a grown-up lady. You always have this hair and you're all wild. And you know, they say, uh, Coco Chanel says, when a woman changes her hair, watch out. Something <laughs> big's going to happen. So Well, good, because this is the new year and you can do it. You know, I cut off all the curls. This is a look I had when I first started comedy 30 years ago. It was <sighs> a very, like, like no-nonsense, the pixie cut. I had kids I was taking care of. You know, make sandwiches at night, go run off to the comedy club, come home, get sleep, take them to school the next morning. So, but it's hence, uh, hence, hence the the mommy comic moniker. Hence that. You know, Dan, here's what happened. And so I'm playing this little bar called Tortillas. It's funny because my husband and I were watching the news and there was a someone killed at Tortillas, and I'm like, it wasn't on comedy night. It wasn't on comedy night. But uh, so I was playing this little bar. And this guy was getting arrested in the audience, big Samoan guy. And he goes, no, wait, wait, let me see the mommy comic. I um, want to see the mommy comic first as they're, you know, arresting him. So <laughs> there were a number of guys, Lily Barsena and Jeff Garcia and, uh, you know, Gilbert Escavel. And they thought that was hilarious. Oh, you're the mommy comic. Oh so, wow! So that wasn't that's so funny because it, it it fits you for goodness sake, you know, because you were uh, one hand mommy and the other hand doing that. But the interesting Willie Barsena, I love Willie. I just saw something today. He's performing out there. He's a good guy. Yeah, I yeah, love Willie. I should have him on sometime um, because your lifelong dream was to be a comic, a funny lady, always, but. You started very late, really, for, for, for that career. You started later than that. And and why I want the dish on what, what happened, that 10 well, years of teaching yeah. got in the way. Nobody raises their kid to be a comic. Nobody <laughs> says, I really want you to be a comedian or an actor. In fact, the other day I was with my mom. That's a whole other story. And I said, Mom, did you ever think I would make it as a comedian? And she said, no. <laughs> I've only seen you once. I'm like, all right. So, um, so anyway, uh, yeah, that was my dream. That's what I always wanted to do. And it never dawned on me that I was watching uh, white male comics, Jewish male comics. It never dawned on me that it was a whole different kind of person than me. And I just had so much naivete that I could do it. But my parents wouldn't support it. And so they said, you teach, you get married or you die. That's how you leave this house. So I chose teaching. And I taught uh, high school for five years, loved it, loved it. And I taught- Where was that, Mia? I don't even know where you grew up. Did you grow up here in LA? In La Puente, and I oh. taught at Bishop Vermont High School. Okay. So, uh, and then from there, I started teaching kindergarten. Hated it. Oh, really? But they're so cute at that age. They are a pain in the ass at that age. <laughs> a I'm like- you know, okay, let's open our books. Oh, I forgot. You don't know how to read. That's <laughs> my job. So, um, and then uh, just always wanted to be a comedian. Went through a divorce, wasn't getting better going through a divorce. And then I took a class at the Ice House uh -huh. and wrote a 20 minute that is still kind of the bulk of my act, my point of view. And so I, um, I got on stage and I never left. Never wow. left. 
Good for you. Good for you. And you you miss teaching on occasion, though. Not the kids, but high school. I but miss you know what? High school. I miss teaching high school. I think they're some of the most brilliant people, some of the most heartfelt people. I think they go through so much and people don't give that age group their um, proper due. You know, I think they just go through so much. And I would see these kids come in and I would say, when you walk in my class, everybody's equal. Everybody's equal. I know that life sucks for some of you out there, but in here, you can get an A. You want an A? I'll give you an A. I would give A's. There. Now you don't have to worry about anything. Now let's work. And, you yeah. know, it's hard being that age. I remember teen years. It's a, it, you know, what the hell is going on? It's it's hard being a teenager. Listen, life yeah. is hard, period. But I think you you have no history. You don't, you know, everything is the end of the world. It's a yeah. lot. Yeah. You just don't fit in. And so that was my heart for so many years. I love those. And I still see them. You know, they're police officers, they're firefighters, wow. they're, nurses, they're doctors, and they remember me. And they come and see, do they, do they sometimes show up in the audience? They do, they do. And they call me by my uh, my former name was Mrs. Myers. Hey, Mrs. Myers. <laughs> I love that. I love that. But let's back up to the kid years. You were saying, because it was mostly male comics who... A, you were always funny, I assume, though your parents may not have thought so. And secondly, who made you laugh from who you saw on TV? Who made you laugh? Whose humor did you appreciate? I always snuck out to see Johnny Carson when he had the comedians. So all those Catskill comics. Love, oh, yeah. Love yeah. Them. You know, yeah. I'm still a fan and I'm still a writer of this traditional setup punch. Yeah, yeah. I just loved it. I don't get a lot of humor that's out there now, you know, and um, I remember going to a couple festivals and it was kind of a new thing, this humor. And it was like, oh, I just don't get it. So I liked the old school Pat Skill comics. And the only two really that were women were uh, Phyllis Diller. Yeah. We could count Toadie Fields. Definitely. Uh, and um, Debbie Reynolds, just in her chat. So I just loved funny women on these late night shows. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be on a late night chat and go work in Vegas and see my name in lights in Vegas. And it, it I've been playing Vegas for years, headlining out there, and it still doesn't get old. I still get excited when I see my name. I know. Still, is, you know, you mentioned Phyllis Diller. I love Phyllis Dill. She started very late as well, as you know. Yeah. She was like 40 or something. But I have to tell you, I always loved her, but I worshipped her after seeing her live. Did you ever see her live? I met her twice. And it's so funny because I told her, oh, Miss Diller, I have a pilot coming out based on my family. And she goes, of course you do. Just so supportive. And she taught me, Dan, how to thank everybody. She remembered everybody's names. She thanked every camera person, every sound person. She thanked, uh, you know, her production people. She just taught me the graciousness of the business. Which is important. But I got to yeah. tell you, I have never, ever laughed as much as seen her live. I uh, couldn't believe it. It was a small room in New York. And, and there were three of us. And you literally, she was like a machine gun. It was one liner, one liner, one liner, one liner. You you actually tried to stop yourself from laughing because while you laughed, you'd lose four lines. I never laughed as hard as her live. And I don't know. Do you find obviously even you do so much television, but um, there usually a live audience there. But is it different when you're in a small club? It may be to some act, but there must be a whole different vibe going than when you're doing it for cameras, even though you have an audience. Yeah, absolutely. One of the most fun things I love to do is in Vegas, there's um, a room that you can go to as a comedian, headliners, and you have to do material you've never done before. You you can oh. it's you you can sit on a stool if you're going to do old material, but when you do a new joke that's never been done before, you stand up. And so it's like a little biker bar and the crowd is really tough. Wow. And uh, I just love doing that room because it just gets your heart pumping, you know, because some of these people don't know who you are. You know, you don't have the big fanfare and music and someone like Brad Garrett introducing you as a friend. So people are, assume you're funny. These people have no idea. So and you're so, jumping off a cliff. You're just jumping off a cliff with no parachute. 
No, and like Robin Williams used to say, this is the one art where we don't have a plan B. We don't have a net, you know? We're gonna fail by ourselves up there or we're gonna succeed by ourselves up there. And you do do so much TV. We have a little montage here of three photos uh, from, uh, what do we have here? Family Feud. See, that's the curly haired girl I know, Family Feud. And then uh, I know you did the Hoff Festival. I did, yeah, yeah. That was and, then, and then Comedy Chingona which you did just before the pandemic. Right before, yeah. I did the uh, Hot Festival and I took my one woman show out there, um, Love, Lust and Lunacy. And then they were they said, oh, we're gonna just uh, do just the girls, comedy ching chingones, we're not gonna tape it. We're gonna light it, but we're not gonna tape it. And so be yourself. And so I had just written a good chunk of material about one of my kids who's transgender. And I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna, what the heck? I'm gonna, and I'm gonna do it. And the host was transgender, male to female. And so that was a real stretch for me. Like, oh, I'm gonna do this in front of her. And, and so- she I went, was there, oh, she was there. Hosting, she was bringing me up. Stop it. Yeah. Olivia, we're, we're going to really talk about Olivia a little later at, with your TED talk, and we're getting there. But go ahead. But let's not get too deep, because I want to get to that later. Yeah. So um, so anyway. Uh, they weren't going to tape it. They weren't going to tape it. And I'm like, all right, you know, I'm going to take a chance. I'm going to do it. And so I swung for the fences, and that was the most supportive group I've ever seen. The very first time I put this material on, they asked me to perform at the Laugh Out Loud Festival for Gay Days at um, in San Diego. And it was at the fair. And I had worked on this material about LBGTQ family and community and the way I was wrapping my head around stuff. We walk in and my husband takes a look at the audience. He goes, just do the A stuff, just do the A stuff. <laughs> and I said, no, I came all the way out here. I wanna give it a shot. Yeah. And they were they could not be more supportive and loving. And so the second time I took a chance was out there in uh, San Antonio and um, did the show and it was great. And then HBO came back later. Oh, what do you know? They did record it and they wanted to know if they could uh, uh, put it up because they were looking for, of course, everybody was looking for, you know, content. Yeah, wow. So, but so that's, that's, that seems a little illegal to tape without your consent, but who's going to sue HBO? Right. Not you. <laughs> yeah. And then the, I said, I have to see the set. Well, Why do you have to see the set? Well, I you're said, kidding. I have to see the set. Yeah. And then I got a, you're like, either it's yes or no. And I go, then it's no. You, and even, it's, not even giving the courtesy to let you look at what you did. Right. And you know, Dan, in this business, I had somebody early on in the business say, don't be available for everything. If you don't, don't feel it, don't do it. And no is such a powerful word because I don't think they hear it often. That's true. So, I'm like, no, I don't, I don't need an HBO special. They're giving everybody an HBO special, you know? And I was feeling pretty, you know, it was during the pandemic and, and I don't have a uh, representation at that time. So it was like, nobody was pushing me. Like, you know how they call you, either you take it or somebody else is going to step up and take your place. Mm -hmm. So it was very freeing to go, no, no, then no. And then my husband, while I was uh, on the phone, my husband's like this, I got <laughs> you don't need so, a manager you have travis he that's my like travis so um so anyways they sent me the set and i said yeah yeah let's let's go with it so we did let's talk yeah. a little bit about how comedy has changed in these last years as as you alluded to momentarily it's a whole i mean my god um i mean there, there's things that you cannot say anymore. And if you do, your career is suddenly over. And and some of it is right. It shouldn't be funny, but it, exactly. it's, it's, yeah. it's a very different thing. How have you adjusted or not adjusted or, you know? I, um, I select my audiences differently. So I perform for older audiences because they're very much the uh, generation that iron sharpens iron. You can have Democrats and Republicans in the same room and they're talking about ideas with each other. You know, they're they're not oversensitive about everything. And I find that they're easy to educate about things that are important 
nowadays in in our social circles and the way we speak and but some of these younger crowds can get so, so oh, god yes so sensitive you know yeah so um where you're up there telling knock knock jokes you know <laughs> um, do they still do not knock jokes do they still exist oh do you not love a good knock knock joke I like a good uh, Catskill version of it. I do. I like those, and I like dick jokes for some reason. <laughs> I dick jokes are hilarious. So, and you I'm call like, yourself a mommy, <laughs> but I didn't toast you. You're my first guest of 2024. So, here's to you, my dear, and thank you for doing the show, our show. Hello. Um. Gotcha. I, I in the uh, when I was t producing for television, I did a lot of things with stand-ups, as you may recall, and that's a tough. Oh my God, that is a tough career. I remember they, you know, we're looking for new talent, and there I'd be at the comedy store or something at one a.m., and there's a line of fifteen young, mostly men, waiting to hopefully get five minutes for an audience that is so wasted they don't know what's going on. I mean, that is a tough tough road to hoe yeah. but you didn't have to do that did you no because you did the ice house and then and you know what and and uh i was i did the the um little show we did all the graduates of the writing class. right of the of the um yeah. of the of the course the comedy course yeah. and then i just so happened a friend of uh my soon-to-be manager Howard Lapidus. I don't know if you remember Howard. Sure, sure, sure. Rick Bernstein. And so one of his friends was in the audience and he got my name and my number and he took it to Howard and he said, this girl, this girl. So Howard wanted me to come in the office and I said, well, I'm a teacher. And he said, do you know who I am? I said, I don't, <laughs> but I know that I have to teach and I'm available on Christmas break or we do it on a weekend. And so, and then I had a little notebook with all kinds of questions my dad told me to ask. <laughs> <laughs> so they just were stymied by this, you know, just stymied that I would be so, you know, I knew where my head was at. I knew what my plan was and I, I wasn't desperate or hungry. And so I was able to be patient and take my time. And I say patient, but I was doing the, um, uh, the, uh, comedy festival in Montreal eight months later. Yeah, so you you didn't have to do that long line at one in the morning, which is not pretty. Um, yeah. So you play to all small rooms, big rooms, but of course the MGM Grand is your home. We have a photo of that beautiful, exciting. I would think. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I still get excited when I see it. I do. And Brad of Garrett. Of course. Brad Garrett cannot be a. a a more generous boss. I mean, just a beautiful friend and a wonderful boss. And he runs the club. He loves comedians. And so he treats us well. I get treated like a queen. And I like the audiences there. Again, they skew a little older. Yeah. You know, I'm doing some of these retirement centers, they're not oversensitive. They're ready to laugh, you know? Yeah, they need to laugh. You know, we all need to laugh these days, that's for sure. Now, you have very fancy schmancy, not only four, count them, four Emmy nominations and a Peabody Award. That's very, very cool. Here you are at various uh, 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 red carpets for the Emmys and your Peabody Award for a PBS program that was very close to your heart, a place of our own. Yes. Tell me about that program. Um, a Place of Our Own was wonderful the way it came about. Uh, do you remember when Rosie O'Donnell was retiring? Mm -hmm. And there were two people that they did pilots for. I was one and Caroline Ray was another. Right. And I didn't get it. Car they gave it to Caroline Ray. She obviously had more, you know, that she was more seasoned in TV. So, but they remembered me. The producers remember me and brought in, brought me in to read for uh, A Place of Our Own. And they were doing a Spanish version, Los Niños en Su Casa. Oh. And, um, because I was a mom and I had my kids spread out so much and childcare changes from one kid to the next, you know? Oh my God, I put her to sleep on her back. I could have killed her. Oh my God, I put him to sleep on his stomach. I could have killed him, you know? Yeah. And so- No handbook, um, no handbook. 
No. And uh, so I was a mom who had a community, my mom, my sister, my girlfriends. And that's what the show was about. It was about sitting with other moms and girlfriends. And, and then I started to get more involved with the writing process, which was nice. I said, let's bring in grandparents. Grandparents are a world of knowledge and we're going to lose it if we don't tap into that. Yes. Yes. And it was, just a, it was a beautiful show. And yeah, I lost all those Emmys. You know who came up to me? Susan Lucci. Susan I was going to ask you about that. At least you're not Susan Lucci. Oh, how he goes, oh my gosh, I've lost 13. <laughs> it doesn't make me feel any better. <laughs> no, not at all better. But you have your Peabody. Come on. That's have a Peabody. very elegant. Very beautiful, wonderful, and a prestigious award. And um, you know about it before you go. So you already know you're getting the Peabody. You already know you're making the speech. You already know that it's going to be into in the uh, New York Museum of the Arts. And you know all that going in. Yeah. So you can really enjoy yourself. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Um, as you mentioned earlier, you, the Chingonas thing was just before the pandemic and everybody was scrambling like what to do, what to do, what to do. And uh, the one of the reasons I see Unstoppable, because nothing can stop you and your ex-Marine hubby, you, you wound up doing a cooking show from your own home kitchen. Yes? Huh. Yeah, I went to the... Um... I went to the grocery store uh, during the pandemic, like right at the beginning, and people were walking around in hospital gowns and masks. And, and oh, God, yes. Was, everybody was terrified. Yeah. So I went to the park and I had a good cry. And then I came home and I told my husband, turn the camera on me. I have something to say. And I said, you know, don't be scared. You know, we're going to get through this together. We're going to figure out how to cook. Um together. We're going to look and see what's available and we're going to get through all this together. Because food was a real issue. People didn't know if our food was safe. I remember they were leaving it out in the sun for three days before they bring it in the house. And yeah. it was scary. They were washing eggs, you know? Yeah. Little did we know we're changing the temperature of an egg and then throwing it in the refrigerator, which could have killed us. But um, so then, uh, then my husband got the call from his work, stay home. So he's like, let's let's do this. Let's produce a show. Next thing you know, there's cameras there's overhead cameras for the food that we're cooking he brought in people that we could chat with people who would say for example we would make albondigas and some people use mint and some people use cilantro so there was this whole discussion <laughs> about which to use and, i vote you know, cilantro i vote for you. Me, too, me too and then when i made mole from a jar i'm like i'm not gonna reinvent the wheel you know <laughs> COVID's outside i'm not gonna go pick chilies and so we did a um, hundred episodes. And then my husband, who is always the person who pushes me always, I say, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. And he goes, yes, you can. And um, he said, because of your Peabody and your talk show host background, let's talk. Let's talk to other people who are in lockdown. So we talked to other comedians because their life came to a stop. And we found out what their hobbies were, how they were handling the pandemic. What was the weirdest purchase they made during the pandemic? um what they were eating what they were cooking and it we did a hundred episodes a hundred and why and how did you know how to get it out there and stream it that's a whole other world my husband is magic he's magic yes. can i borrow him for about five years yeah oh absolutely brad garrett did a, a podcast called no prisoners and my husband produced it and uh he's really good at talking people through uh, just the button situation. You know, you and I are from the generation where you touch the wrong button and, you know, ah. the stairs go up and the world ends and there's this clock ticking down. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It, it is a different world. Um, let's talk. You mentioned Olivia. And uh, that was um, a life changer for you, as it would be for any parent, but especially because you as a comic as you always said, you know, most people, uh, most families hide their personal secrets and lives and you make a living off it. So suddenly everything uh, turned upside down for you. And, and and the moment that you found out, I want you to talk about that because that eventually led to a TED talk that you did just recently, right? Wasn't it last, last fall? Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, we have a photo here of the TED Talk, and you said that was the most challenging thing you have ever oh, done. So hard. It was working every day for eight months to construct one perfect sentence after another. There's not yeah. one bit of fat, not, not one wasted word. Um, everything had to be vetted, and it was um, tremendously hard. There are a lot of times I had to be talked off a ledge, like, I just don't want to do this anymore. And then you're dealing with a subject that is very um, sensitive and also they wanted levity. So there was a big order to fill. And um, and I kept trying to do some comedy about it and good friends like Brad Garrett would say, it's not funny, it's not there yet. It's not, you're still angry, you're still angry. And so I really had to craft a set um, that would be funny, that would add some humor. And I had to remember the reason people like my humor is because when I'm done, my kids are their kids. My husband is their husband. My mother is their mother. We have more in common than we think we do, you know? And sure. they, and also after I talked about having a transgender kid, you'd be shocked Dan, how many parents came up to me. My kid's an alcoholic, my kid takes drug, my kid gambles, my kid ran away. You know, they just, they're, they're, willing to share some part of themselves where your kid goes sideways and there's nothing you can do or your kid has a different plan and there's nothing that you can do about it and so it was a real eye opener and um i carry a picture where i'm backstage at flappers with two comedians i really admire jimmy brogan and um uh oh my gosh i'm drawing a blank huh fritz yeah fritz coleman uh -oh. and they said uh, Debbie, you got to talk about this. You've got to talk about this on stage. There are so many parents our age that are dealing with difficult situations with adult kids, you know? And here I was talking about teeny tinies because I was too scared to make them grow up on stage and deal with it. Right. You, you, I, I read somewhere where you said that you, you got older, but the kids in the act never got older. They were all right. little. And all of a sudden, this massive, massive change. And well, you were going through it as a parent, forget that you're a stand-up. Just as a parent, it's 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 a lot. It's a lot to process and to understand. And it's even as a gay man, it's it's all very confusing. All of these new, you know, the fluid and the this and the trans, and you're and you want to be sensitive, and it is sensitive, but it's then it's it's your child, and you suddenly have a daughter instead of a son. So you're not only dealing with that as a as a woman, as a mom, but how to integrate that into what your your life career is. That's that's a lot. Yeah. And you know, I remember the day I picked up my oldest, my youngest from uh, school and we were driving home. And, you know, I teenager, I didn't think she knew a whole lot about the world. And so we're just driving and she, and we started talking about her sibling being transgender. And she just started explaining it to me with no shame, no judgment, right. just here's what it is. Yes. Like, let's go home so I can write it down. So, um, you know, cause this generation, they're willing to talk about these things. Yes, yes. It's not it's not weird to them. It's just, well, they they like boys, they like girls. It's right. Yeah. Gen we're I mean, generalizing. There are plenty of people that don't like it at all. But right. but it's it's shocking. Uh, young people, they're very open yeah. about it. Yeah, there's no judgment, you know. Um, so we got home and I took out a pen and a paper pad and she said, okay, let's just start with, okay, you are cisgender. I'm like, oh, I don't think of that. <laughs> that sounds racy. That, that sounds, sounds racy. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I got a label. <laughs> and, you know, she goes, so is dad. I'm like, let's not tell dad because, you know, <laughs> things are so crazy in this casa. So um, she goes, look, just relax. That's all I heard during this conversation. Relax. She said, um, it just means you're a woman who identifies as a woman in a woman's body, cisgender. Transgender is, you know, Olivia was born a woman, but born in a man's body and she will get corrective surgery to straighten all this out, transgender. And then she started going with other things like um, gender fluid and non-binary. And I'm like, wait, 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 is anybody in our house that? And she put <laughs> No. And I said, 
well, let's just save it. So, you know, if you bring a friend over, let me know beforehand, you know, about pronouns or whatever, you know, I need to know those things. So, um, and as a mom, I call everybody honey. So it pronouns haven't been a big issue. <laughs> <laughs> What do you want to eat, honey? I can never remember names, so everybody is darling. It's just simpler. <laughs> it's simpler. Well, how how are you doing now? And how is Olivia doing? How how old is Olivia? She'll be 30. Yeah. Um, very honestly, and I would say a year ago it was hard for me to talk about it because I always felt like a failure because I don't have a relationship. And um, it's not that I'm not loving. It's not that she's not loving. It's that she is a transgender person whose past is hard to deal with. And from what I know about some transgender people, to even look at a childhood picture can be traumatizing. Yes. To hear their dead name can be traumatizing. To, you know, it's like any family member when you go back for holidays and everybody falls into the oldest, the youngest, the silly, the bully, the tattletale, mm. even as adults. So for her to come back, where would she fall into step? That's right. And so, um, so, you know, she lives her life. She knows that if she needs anything, we're here. But I have to respect that that is her decision. And I think it's hard for other parents to hear that that's the step that we took because we respect her. Yeah, wow. But you know, the, the way you just said, it makes it very clear about you do fall into, uh, you know, why it's difficult for her to see herself as a 10 year old little boy playing baseball. It right. is because you, you, we all do fall into, I re, I, re, I reconnected with two friends, a man and a woman that we, we were very close in high school. And suddenly they showed up backstage one day in the last, 10, 12 years. And I'm telling you, the minute we get in the car, we are Don, Renee, and, and Eddie, because I was born Edward Daniel. I hated Eddie. Right into that. It, you know, Don and I picking on Renee. That's what we do. Yeah. And we got in the car and it was like it was 1959. You go into that old thing. And, sh and sh she can't do that or a transgender cannot do that. Right, right. So... You know we're very sensitive we about it and we you know we don't have pictures of her when she was little and we refer to her with her pronouns when speaking about her and she knows that you know the porch light is left on every single night should she need anything so um yeah and so i've learned a lot being a transparent um i've just learned about the human condition just the human condition right and it's like you know because she's still my child yes so it I still want her to leave the world a better place. I still want her to contribute to society. I still want her to continue with education if she wants. I still want her to be safe and sound. I still want her to be a generous person. You still want those things for your kids, you know, no matter how they identify. Or how and, old they get, or how old they get. They're your kid. Yeah, yeah. And I think those boundaries make a kid feel safe, too. You know, it's not about you being gay. It's about the fact that I've told you to clean your room 6,000 times. I haven't done it yet, you know? And so, and a little bit of that is in the TED talk, you know, and on, in my standup, oh, it's because I'm transgender. No, no, no. You know, I need you to move your car because every day you take that parking spot and it belongs to somebody else, <laughs> you know? How, how did Olivia react to the TED talk? Did she see it? I haven't heard. I haven't heard. And it is it is a true story about how I was I met up with her. And this is uh before she came, this is her coming out story. And we we had a whole day together, Dan. We had a whole day. I did the whole mom college kid thing. We shopped for groceries. We went to shop for clothing. He's we still went, your son. He's your son during all yeah. this. Yeah. We went out for coffee. We went out to eat everything. Then it's time for me to go. I got to go. Got to go. Got to catch a plane. Got to go home. And this kid who has been raised by a comedian, whose timing is impeccable, said he, he started to get out of the car. And I'm using his pronouns him because that was who he was at the time. And he, and as he's leaving the car, he leans in and goes, hey, mom, you know what transgender is? And I'm like, yeah, I I think so and he goes oh okay i'm that bye 
close the door. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Uh, And there you are in yeah. the car. Oh, yeah. Boom. Yeah. Timing is everything, you know? And, and again, I can't take it personally. I knew that this was her way to protect herself. Like nobody's going to ask me any questions. If I had said at the beginning of the day, it would become a thing and I'm not ready to talk about it. So. And, you know, you say, and you're quite right. That's just always your kid, no matter, you know, what, what happens. And I'm sure you're still her mommy and I'm sure she loves you. And it's just something you have to go through and it will all, come together i'm sure one day yeah yeah and i have two other kids <laughs> <laughs> well you don't know what's ahead with them but you you know they, you know they, you, they may surprise you one day <laughs> they're they're older like the oldest one uh had a baby she got she got married dan march 14th pie day because they're they're so cute they're nerds and so they pick pie day march 14th i'll never forget it <laughs> Driving up to San Francisco, March 14th, 2020, driving up there, and I'm like, they're going to lose the venue. This COVID thing, I don't know what it is, but I think they're going to start closing stuff. I don't know what this COVID thing is. And my husband kept saying, no, no, it's going to be fine. Nobody's going to close the venue. And so we get there, and she says, mom, I lost my venue for COVID. Mm -hmm. And she lost, um, she got a second one, lost that one, got a third one. It's stuck. And um, so we we're up in San Francisco trying to put on a wedding as COVID was closing everything down. Wow. And her wedding had to be sent by text to people where it was going to be next. They're Quaker, which means that their ceremony is uh, private and there's no officiate, but everybody wishes their blessings on them. Everybody signs the, the wedding certificate. So I think about a hundred people out of 300 showed up. And so we were just up to our eyeballs with booze and food and cake. And we have pictures of them with the newspaper going, San Francisco closes down at midnight. It was- <laughs> Unreal. That's the only word. It was unreal, huh? Yeah. You know, sometimes I think back to COVID going, was it that bad? Was it that bad? You know what? That's not an, an you're you're right because and it was bad and I I was uh, I don't want to go into the whole thing but I was caring for my partner of forty three years out of nowhere and um, and anyway I lost him a year later and um, and so that's what my life for me that was COVID year you know and then I'll start to remember going to the market at six in the morning seniors because I thought okay COVID germs. You know, they wash it overnight. No one's been in there yet. And yeah. as you say, it was the mask. It was the gloves. That first morning I went to pavilions, it was like I was walking into the lion's den. It was horrifying. Yeah. And, and I think we've all kind of forgotten that because it was so unreal. It just was unreal. It just was. It but was. Yeah, it was and we have very dear friends who live in Texas. Dear friends. And this is when you couldn't find Lysol or wipes or toilet Yes. Yes. And yeah. she would send me pieces of the stuff. And I go, was she, where was she sending them from? Texas. Wow. And I said, where are you getting this stuff? She goes, CVS Moss. And I said, but they're on the shelf. She goes, oh yeah, we have plenty. What and, the hell? and she says, cause in Texas, we don't believe that, you know, the, their government didn't believe that it was. Oh, so it was just regular life as usual. They weren't buying 57 rolls like we were here. Yeah. And that was part of the cooking show was to hold somebody's hand and say, we're going to get you through this, you know, because the news, the daily news, the morning news was they were having star chefs come on going, OK, you go in your cheese drawer and you take out your fun Tina cheese. I'm like, who the fuck has fun <laughs> Tina cheese, right? And, um, you know, and we're going to deglaze using this. <laughs> While well, you're looking for toilet paper. And they're deglazed. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I was teaching how to cook out of a crock pot and um, an Instapot and, uh, you know, doing breakfast for dinner because everything was available. And it just turned into this community that started to take care of each other. Yeah. And there was great flooding in Texas. And we had people from the show in California reaching out to the people in Texas going, how can we support you? What do you need? And so... It was just this beautiful hand-holding 
through uh, COVID. And we're still here. Where's Travis? Is he still floating around there? He's still here. Put, put my head in because we've been talking about him. We, we're going to close now and go into, hey, Travis, how are you? Hey, Dan, how are you? I hear you're for hire. <laughs> well, apparently someone needs me for five years, so we'll work out some terms after the show. Okay, sounds good. We're going to move into our, uh, I don't know, P uh, Abelardo, did any, any folks writing in questions? Well, we have, uh, uh, let's see, a couple people here. We have uh, Brenda Brubaker. She says she grew up, this is on Facebook. She grew up on La, in La Puente also. Did you go to La Salette Elementary from uh, 65 up? No, I went to Wing Lane. And then I went Wing to- Wing Lane, like Ringley Brothers Circus? Wing, <laughs> Wing, Wing. Oh, oh Wing <laughs> One of our, our, our big friends, Roberta Martinez, uh, talking about the show that you did uh, when you were a teacher or, uh, it was a wonderful show. I was teaching preschool at the time and it was just so right. It was a good show. It was a good show. And I remember my manager at the time wanting to, wanting me to quit and go into something for, with national television and uh, not national television, broadcast television, you know, the four families when it was just them. And right. it's like, it's PBS and PBS money. And I'm like, you know, when PBS hires you for 22 shows, guess what happens? You do 22 shows. Yeah. yeah. And you put your head down on the pillow at the end of the night and you said, I did something good. I did something good. Right. We have uh, John Echeveste, our uh, La Plaza's uh, former CEO and a great friend of, of ours. Uh, in my PR days, I worked with you on A Place of Our Own. I then caught your act at the ice house. It was like seeing two different people. How did you keep yourself from cracking wise on the show? I was very, very careful. I was very respectful of the host position I had and I kept it very separate from comedy. So I, you know, I didn't advertise obviously on the show that I was a comedian. Um, I just really talked about my teacher background. And of course, the one thing that brought me there was being a mom, being a mom who had kids, I remember at one time they go, how did you hit all those talking points? You didn't pick up your card once. I go, cause I have kids and I want to know. I want to know how often I'm supposed to take them to the dentist. <laughs> I didn't even know they were supposed to. Um, but that's a very nice comment um, that they noticed that I kept the two separate. All right. Uh, uh, and John is a, is a crazy comedian fan. I mean, from the, uh, W.C. Fields, uh, 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 Groucho Marx, he loves all of those. So you're up there with them. Uh, Roberta um, asks, asks uh, uh, no, she says, I first saw Debbie when she was at the Hollywood Bowl, and I roared when she shared what it was like to get a mammogram. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, your, your past is haunting you, Debbie. Travis just told me, he goes, remember you said corn tortilla, that afterwards it looks like yeah. a corn tortilla, and then you fold it up and put it back in your bra, and then I took it out and made an origami <laughs> swan for him. <laughs> but if it's something like, you know, um, a mammogram or a colonoscopy, or your kid is going sideways, or you're depressed, or you're seeking out therapy, I think those things are important to get on stage and talk about so that people will associate it with some levity and some warmth and go, yeah, it's time for my mammogram. It does hurt. It does, you know, cost me some time, but, you know, I need to go to my mammogram. And there's some humor in it. Yeah, you have to put humor in it. That's how people remember stuff. And that's how you get through life. I mean, telling you, humor and, you know, uh, you gotta laugh, man, especially today. I don't even watch the news anymore, it's frightening. Isn't it? Mm. It's so scary. Yeah. It's so scary. We can't even watch late night guys because they're rehashing it all. Yeah. 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 So yeah. It's yeah. just frightening. It's frightening. But we'll get yeah. through because we're unstoppable. We're unstoppable. And I'll be a lot of those unstoppable. Yes, I am. And one more before before I stop. Uh Kim Chavez, uh, another former colleague and dear friend. Uh hi Debbie. I loved working with you. Your show changed my life. Kim worked at, wow. at KCET. You know, we had so much fun on that show. And 
I took what Phyllis Diller taught me. I worked with Phyllis Diller, with uh, Charo, with uh, Tony Orlando, with Jose Feliciano. And these people took me under their wing and they're like, look, Miha, you need to thank everybody. Everybody is important. You aren't the only one here. It's not about you. It's about a group effort. And those people really taught me how to reach out and how to lean on your production team and respect them. And the director's doing his job because he was hired as a director, not you. And, you know, with the writers, the same thing. You know what? It, it was my delivery. Let me try it a different way before you rewrite. Let me see if I can make it funny. You direct me. So it was very much letting everybody do what was in their wheelhouse. And those people at, at KCT were so supportive and loving and hardworking. Hard working. We did five shows in one day because I was an idiot. I was an I, idiot that went, yeah, I think I can. I've never done TV. I'm like, yeah, I could do five shows in one day. And you did. We did. There you go. There you go. And here we have uh, finally uh, Michelle Counts, uh, a place of our own. You visited my Head Start classroom at Placentia. Oh, isn't that fantastic? Are they are are there those shows available anywhere? I mean, it's uh, they must be on YouTube at the very least. I think they're on the KCET website. I, I believe you can. They've got them archived there. Um, if not, we can invite everyone over to our house. We've got the full DVD set and the VHS. Never mind that. What are you going to cook? <laughs> what? Oh, I know. People are always asking about that. You know, it was it was a lot to turn the kitchen into a production. Of and, course. And we had neighbors that were fantastic. We did a quesadilla episode. <laughs> that was when I saw somebody with the Fontina cheese. I'm like, like 30, <laughs> yeah, we made 36 quesadillas and people in our neighborhood who watched the show were turning in requests. So at the same time we were making them, we were handing them out the Throwing door. Them out the window. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, that was, that was so great to be part of the community. Oh, it, was, it felt so good. We'll make quesadillas. We'll make your favorite meal. Yeah. Of quesadillas. Al mondigas with cilantro sounds pretty good too, yeah. though. Yeah. You know, if you can't, if you can't love on people, if you can't share with people, if you can't educate people with what you do with humor, then why are you, why are you in there? You know, why are you doing it? If that's, you can't... that's the greatest gift of all to entertain, but to also educate. Right. That, that's the biggie. That's the real deal. Yeah. When you're having fun and doing something great and, and at the same time, People are learning something. You can you can change lives. You know that. Whether it's a mammogram or it's the use of pronouns or, you know, whatever it is that you're teaching them. It's a teachable moment. Yeah. Yeah. Colonoscopy or as I call it, safe sex. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Think about it. Oh, I love that. Propofol. I'm like, oh my gosh, no wonder Michael Jackson OD'd on this. It's been... <laughs> <laughs> okay i toast you both travis and and debbie i'm so happy to see you all grown up here's to a wonderful 2024 abelardo where's your where's your drink there mine right here Salud. there you go here's to 2024 and i hope to see you all in person soon thank you Thanks for doing the happy hour for having us bye-bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye guys thank you thank you abelardo bye-bye you're thank welcome you. Abelardo, thank you. Of course, thank you so much. This was very, very enjoyable, very informative. I was just looking online, and uh, your TED Talk is on YouTube. So just uh, yes. go ahead and, and do uh, uh, search for Debbie Gutierrez, and the name of the, uh, at least the name, the title that it has here is How My Transgender Child Made Me an Authentic Comedian. And that's going to be a must-see in my family. I have uh, our family members, grandchildren, who are uh, uh, transitioning, so... Uh, the more I learn, the oh. better I'll be as a grandfather. So thank you. For oh, that's beautiful. So much. Oh, of course. I wish the best for you. Thank you. Uh, and and thank you out there who joined us on t tonight's En Casa Con La Plaza's Dan Guerrero Happy Hour. What a way to start the year. I mean, this has been incredible, an incredible, very informative, very entertaining, and just wants me to learn more about Debbie and, and enjoy her comedy. And a lot that's on YouTube and maybe even... Check her out at Las Vegas. It's been a while since I've been out there with my with my wife. Okay, so that's it for tonight. If you uh, didn't catch the entire episode or you want to see the whole session again, uh, we're posting that on our YouTube page at La Plaza LA. It remains here on our Facebook page as well. 
at La Plaza LA. Uh, we have a lot going on for 2024, as I mentioned. We're just getting started. This is just the, the first week since we've been back, second week of January. But throughout the year, you can enjoy events, programs uh, at La Plaza on our main campus, outdoors and indoors, uh, both uh, programs that we uh, produce plus, uh, plus others. We, we're hosting the fifth edition of uh, Latina Fest in March, which is great. Taco Madness is coming back as well, as well as our Summer of Salsa series. And we're going to have a cumbia night and a reggaeton night and an oldies night as well. So keep a, an eye out on our website, lapca.org, and on our Facebook page at La Plaza LA. And subscribe to our newsletter. That way you'll get all the information uh, 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 on a monthly basis. Plus check out our socials. Uh, we're on, on X, Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook, of course. We're on LinkedIn. We're on TikTok as well. All at La Plaza LA. And you'll be the first to know about a lot of the stuff that's going on. Okay. Con eso, muy buenas noches a todos. Hasta la próxima. All right. Bye-bye.